Hello, Pastor Philip here. Today we're going to be doing the week two of the First Thessalonians study. We'll be looking at First Thessalonians chapter, excuse me, that should be chapter 2, 1 through 12. I've already messed up on something on my PowerPoints. Glad you caught it. So let's open up with prayer. Father, we want to thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for this day that we can look into your word. Lord, I pray for each one, Lord, whatever day it might be, that they are studying this, that, Lord, they will receive from you the Holy Spirit. You will speak to their hearts. Thank you for your word, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so as we look at this um, right now, let me read the scriptures with you. For you yourselves know, brothers and sisters, about our coming to you. It is not proven to be purposeless. But although we suffered earlier and were mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of much opposition. For the appeal we make does not come from error or impurity or with deceit, but just as we have been <coughs> excuse me, but just as we have been approved by God, who examines our proved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we declare it not to please people, but God, who examines our hearts. For we never appeared with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is our witness, nor to seek glory from people, either from you or from others. Although we could have imposed our weight as apostles of Christ, instead we became little children among you. Like a nursing mother caring for her own children, with such affection for you, we were happy to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. For you recall, brothers and sisters, our toil and drudgery, while working night and day so as not to impose a burden on any of you, we preach to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and so is God, as to how holy and righteous and blameless our conduct was toward you who believe. As you know, we treated each one of you as a father treats his own children, exhorting and encouraging you and insisting that you live in a way worthy of God, who calls you to his own kingdom and his glory. So as we look at those scriptures, let's jump into question one. What happened to Paul at Philippi? And if we go back to verses one and two, for you know yourself, for you yourselves know, brothers and sisters, about our coming to you, it is not proven to be purposeless. But although we suffered earlier and were mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the courage in our God to declare. So what do we know? That he suffered and was mistreated. And according to Acts chapter 16, verses 23 and 24, Paul had a public flogging and feet were put in stocks while he was confined in prison. So let me just turn to those passages in um, Acts chapter 16, excuse me, Acts chapter 16, and we're going to look at verses 23 and 24. And it says this there in those verses. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stock. So this was Paul and Silas that were put into prison, and they were flogged, beaten, and then they were put into stocks in the inner part of the prison. Question two, ask this. After his poor treatment in Philippi, how did Paul preach the gospel in Thessalonica? In verse two, it tells us this. But although we suffered early, were mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of much opposition. So what he's saying, we preached with courage and boldness despite opposition that they found. Even though they were flogged, thrown into prison, they did not let this discourage them to where they couldn't go out and do what God had called them to do. They were going to accomplish what God had called for them to do, and so they did it with courage, they did it with boldness, and we can see, if, if you go back to the book of Acts, you can see how the apostles, and even talks about Paul, how that they, even though they faced much, much opposition, they still preached the word, even though they were mistreated. This is what Paul says we're doing here. Then it goes into question three. 
What was Paul entrusted with? When did he receive this trust? Paul was entrusted with the gospel, the good news of Jesus. Because verse 3 says, For the appeal we make does not come from error or impurity or with deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we declare it not to please people, but God who examines our heart. They were approved by God and entrusted with the good news. And God did this. God gave them, entrusted them with the gospel, with, with the word that would save lives, that would change lives, that would bring people into a relationship with Jesus. And then Paul asks, says, and the question was, when did he receive this trust? I believe it was at a time that he was converted and Paul was converted, we know about the road to Damascus and the bright light and how he was blinded. And then um, he was prayed over and the scales fell and he, he, he was entrusted with the gospel. And in first, and in Titus, excuse me, I was thinking first Timothy, but in Titus, let me get to that scripture there. Titus chapter one, Verse 3 says, But in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God our Savior. This is Paul writing to Titus, and he's saying, you know, it was entrusted to me and commanded, and it was God that did it. God entrusted it to Paul. I believe it was at the time he was converted, but also as he learned more and as he walked, as he preached, that God gave him this message and this gospel to share with others. Question four says, what did Paul deny using at Thessalonica? Now, if we go to verses five and six, for we never appeared with flattering speech. Now, what would flattering speech be? It was they were eloquent speakers and they knew how to get you to laugh and get you to cry and move your emotions. Says, we didn't come with flattering speech. As you know, nor with a pretext for greed. They didn't come out of this because they were coveting something. Some, some translations talk about covetousness. He didn't do it because there was something that they wanted to get out of it. He didn't come with flattering speech. He didn't come with a pretext for greed. And it says, it says God is our witness, nor to seek glory from people. They did not come with the speech that would sway people. They didn't come because they were greedy and needed to move people in order to get something. They did not come to seek glory from people. God had entrusted them with the gospel. God had put this, this in to Paul. And now he's saying, I didn't come to manipulate. I didn't come to, to please you. I didn't come just to make you feel good, I came to share with you the good news of Jesus. I'm just going to give it to you straight. That's not how I know it. That's how it was given. I'm going to give it to you straight. I don't gain anything out of this. I'm following the call of my life. I'm not being getting rich by this. We know that Paul was thrown into prison. He was shipwrecked. He was beaten. All of these things happened. If, if he was doing it for greed, he would have done it in a way where that didn't happen. But he did it because he had been trusted, entrusted with the good news of Jesus Christ. So this is this is how Paul came to them. And then question six. Excuse me, question five. How did Paul treat the saints at Thessalonica? How did Paul treat these ones? No, we know when he came from Philippi, he had been mistreated. So when he came to Thessalonica, how was how did it, Paul treat the saints there? Verses 7 and 8 says, Although we could have imposed our weight as apostles of Christ, instead we became little children among you, like a nursing mother caring for her own children with such affection for you. So they came with affection. We were happy to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become dear to us. He says, we didn't come and impose our weight as apostles. Hey, we've come and we've got this good news. You have to take care. 
we didn't do that. We came as like little children. We just came as little children. We came humble. We came um, you know, full of joy and excitement like children would. We just kind of wanted to fit in and like a nursing mother caring for her own children. We, we loved you. We have affection for you. We're happy to share with you not only the gospel, but their own lives. They gave all for these people. They did not hold back. Even though they had been mistreated and abused in Philippi, they didn't say, you know what, we're going to hold back because they may do the same. No, they put everything into it. They loved them. They cared for them. They worked with them. And it says, because you have become dear to us. Have you ever heard that phrase, you learn to love someone? I believe this is kind of what they're talking about here because you had become dear. The more they were there with them, the more they got to know them, the more they shared the gospel with them, the more they saw their response and maybe questions and their care for Paul. He says, you become dear to us. You become dear to us. What did Paul impart to those at Thessalonica? So they become dear to him and and he came not with flattering speech or out of envy or to seek glory. And he's loved them and has great affection for them. What did Paul give to them? Verse 8 says, with such affection for you, we were happy to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become. So they shared the gospel and their lives. The gospel and their lives. The gospel is the good news about Jesus, that he was born, he lived his life, he died for us, he was buried, he rose again, and today he sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. The fact that we, because of him our lives can be changed, our sin is washed away, and heaven is now our home. He shared with them the good news of the gospel of God, but also their own lives. They gave everything. To these people. They ate with them. They slept with them. We're going to see later. They, they worked there. They, they did all of these things because they were dear to them and they loved them. So he shared the gospel. He imparted to them the gospel of God, the good news about Jesus, the good news about what he's done and what he can do. Question seven says, describe Paul's manner of life while in Thessalonica. For you recall, brothers and sisters, our toil and drudgery. By working night and day so as not to impose a burden on any of you, we preach to you the gospel of God. What Paul did, he came and says, you know what? Remember it how it says, we, we didn't impose our weight as apostles of Christ. We didn't become a burden on you. What we've done, we've toiled and we've worked night and day to, to pay our own way, to make our own living. And we preach the gospel of God to you. I can just imagine Paul here. And as we remember back at the start, it was Silvanus and, and, and Timothy. Um from Paul, it says in verse 1 of chapter 1, from Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians, said, we didn't come to be a burden. We've jumped in. We've made our way. We've paid our way. We've paid our, our, our dues. We've, we've had toils and we've had drudgery. We've, we've done work. But then with that, we've also preached the gospel. So we've worked day and night like you do. But we've also shared the gospel with you. And we want you to receive that. And we go back to why did they do this? Because they loved them. They were dear to them. They didn't want to be a burden. They didn't want to overstay their welcome. They wanted to be able to share the gospel. So Paul jumped in and he worked. And he, then he preached. And he'd get the next day and he'd work. And then he'd preach. Get up the next day, he'd work. And he preached, and he did this over and over to get the gospel to the Thessalonians. Question eight. What does it mean to live in a way worthy of God? Verse, start in verse 10. 
You are witnesses, and so is God, as to how holy and righteous and blameless our conduct was toward you who believe. As you know, we treated each one of you as a father treats his own children, exhorting and encouraging you and assisting that you live in a way worthy of God who calls you to his own kingdom and his glory. See, Paul is saying, you've seen how we've lived righteous and holy and blameless in our conduct. And we've treated you as a father treats his own children. And we've done that to exhort you, to encourage you, to, and, and, and insisting that you live in a way worthy of God who calls you to his own kingdom and his glory. But watching how Paul lived, they were encouraged to live as he did. Holy, righteous, blameless conduct. He said, you know what? We want you to live as we live. There's, there's another passage somewhere where Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. And so he, he, he came as an example. This is what you do. You're not a burden. You're not, you're not just taking because under the guise of, I'm, I'm here to share the gospel. No, they came in. We're going to work with you. We want you to watch us. We want you to see us every day when we go to the workplace. But you know what? We're the same in the workplace as we are standing up sharing the gospel. We're the same at home. We're the same at work as we are at church. We want you to live in a, in a way that is worthy of, of God, to have that name Christian, to say, you know what, that's an example of how Christ was. The Christian is a Christ follower. It's a believer in Christ, someone who follows him. And as we follow him, we become imitators of him. We become more like him. And so the world sees us. And so when he talks about walking in a way worthy of God, it doesn't mean if you do wrong, you're no longer worthy to be a Christian. But when we carry that label Christian, the world watches us, and we need to, with the power of Holy Spirit and understanding the grace that we have and knowing that we're not perfect, to live as well as we can, as Paul says there, to be holy and righteous and blameless. You know how we, we live holy, righteous, and blameless? Because we know that through Christ and what his blood has done and by his grace through faith, we are holy, we are righteous, and we are blameless. And all we're doing, we're not trying to become what we're not. We're just trying to live out who we are in Christ. In Christ, that's who you are, holy, righteous, and blameless. And so how do we live that? By knowing that we're in Christ and that through him, he gives us the power to live that. And when we fail, we go to that person and we say we're sorry. I can just imagine Paul at some point out working or something, hits his finger, does something, and he gets angry. Maybe somebody did something that caused it to happen. And maybe he turned and maybe he had a harsh word. I don't know. But if he did, to live holy, righteous, and blameless, he probably went right back to him and said, you know what? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. And then he had the ability to preach and share the gospel because they saw his conduct. And then question nine. How did God call us to his own kingdom and his glory? See that verse 12, exhorting and encouraging you, insisting that you live in a way worthy of God who calls you to his own kingdom and his own glory. God called us through his son. We become a child of God by simple faith in Jesus and we receive grace. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to seek and to save everyone. Because if he came to seek and to save that which was lost, everyone here was lost until they come to know Jesus as their Savior. And so what, how did he call us to his own kingdom and his own glory? Because he sent his son, and his son loved us enough to die on the cross. And because of that cross, we find grace. We find mercy through simple faith in Jesus. And he calls us to receive him. I believe that everyone is called to receive Christ. Not everyone will select him. Not everyone will choose that calling. Not everyone will receive that call. But we're called. And he called us to his kingdom. It's based upon Jesus and his glory, which is all wrapped up in the Son. Remember Paul said, we didn't come for our glory. We came to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus. See, when we, not, we take, make it less about us and more about Jesus, what we're doing is, we're called to his kingdom and his glory when it's not about us anymore. That's part of being the kingdom. It's all about Christ. It's all about what he's done. It's all about what he's doing 
in our lives and he's doing through us. Paul's manner of life. We need to be imitators. And we follow Christ is what he's saying. Now next week, we'll be into um, lesson three. And we'll be looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 20. And it's, the title is Receiving the Lord. I find here I've already started my first few questions. I encourage you to read 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13, 13 through 20. That's where we'll be next week. Uh, thank you for joining me today. Let's close with prayer. Father, we want to thank you for your goodness, your mercy, your grace to us. Thank you for your word, which is true. Lord, help us to understand that you have called us. You've entrusted us with the gospel, and we're to go to share this to others, not just through our words, but, Lord, through our actions, through our work, through everything that we do. Lord, I pray for each one that's doing this study, that they listen to this, that, Lord, they will grow in you, that the gospel will be like a seed that takes root and grows in them. And, Lord, I thank you for all that you're doing and for what you're doing in their lives. Lord, we give you all of the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great rest of the day. I look forward to seeing you Sunday. God bless.